All right, everybody. Hello and welcome. Can we all vote to just move this thing out by the pool? Yeah, what a day, huh? It's fantastic. Welcome. Uh, this panel, just to make sure you know you're on the right flight or the right panel, macroeconomic trends, monetary and fiscal responses. Good. Everybody appears to be looking for this panel, so we're in, we're in great shape. We've got a great lineup. It's an important topic. We're going to hit a lot of it, and uh, let's get right to it now, and I'm going to introduce our, our, our panelists here. We've got a great list. Coming from the far right, we've got Seth Carpenter, Acting Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets, the Department of Treasury. We've got Dimitri Demekis, Assistant Director of Monetary and Capital Markets Department for the IMF. Scott Miner, Chairman of Investments, Global Chief Investment Officer of Guggenheim Partners. Tad Ravel, Group Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer of Fixed Income at TCW. And Paul Sheard, Chief Global Economist and Head of Global Economics and Research, Standard & Poor's Rating Services. I am Brian Sullivan. And as with many panels, I like to begin this one with a test. <laughs> it's easy, and there's, I mean, there's a wrong answer. I'll see if anybody can get this. Who said this? Is everybody listening? Seth, you all right down there? I'm listening. All right. The United States economy is like a poker game where the chips have become concentrated in fewer and fewer hands and where the other fellows can stay in the game only by borrowing. When their credit runs out, the game will stop. Who said that? Mariner Eccles, Federal Reserve Chairman from 1934 to 1948. He said that in 1951 in a book. And if I told you that was from 60 years ago, you would have said that's from the last five years, right? And so I guess, Scott, I'll start with you. Because you are concerned about how things will play out, I brought up this quote because I wonder, have we always been concerned? Is this time really different? You know, it's interesting, Brian. It's, it, it's uh, like the old line that uh, Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat it. Repeat it. It just rhymes. And so, um, you know, a, a lot of the things that we're living through today look like what happened in the late 30s and the 1940s. And that is that um, there was a financial crisis, there was massive regulation put on the system, uh, and the, uh, the ultimate result was that the Federal Reserve grew its balance sheet uh, to somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 30 to 40 percent of GDP which is exactly where we are today. So I guess maybe history does repeat itself. You know, and I, I, I brought that up, Seth, because it, there does appear to be, I, I don't want to call it recency bias, but the reality is that the majority of people running capital and running money at the time when Mariner Eccles was the Fed chairman are probably not many now. And so we, we often forget about history and we forget about, about the fact that maybe we haven't been here, but concern over debt and borrowing and credit and the Fed and the Treasury and the government has always been out there. Do you feel like trust is often misplaced? Do I feel like the trust in... You. In, <laughs> uh, and by the way, and I, I say this, Seth and Dimitri are here primarily in a personal capacity. I have to say that as representatives of, you know, who they are. So, so I, I, I hope uh, very sincerely that the trust is not misplaced. Um, I think the perspective with your quiz and, and the perspective that Scott brought up is, are, is extraordinarily helpful. Um, it's very, very easy to forget history. We look when, so I'm overseeing financial markets now for the Treasury, and one aspect of financial markets right now is an increase in volatility, and a lot of people are ascribing any number of causes to that increase in volatility. And I think one, one issue that history would teach us is to look over business cycles. And as we come out of an economic, as we come through an economic expansion and we're looking at some normalization of policy, often volatility starts to increase because there's less, less certainty about rates. And so that kind of longer run, uh, historically based uh, perspective, I think, can really help sort of cut through some of the, 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 the questions that we have today. I, I guess, so, Dimitri, one thing that is very new, at least in, in my, because <laughs> I don't study the yield curves of boons. And I've said boon more times at this conference than I have in the last 10 years combined, by the way. Uh, there's about $5 trillion in negative real interest rates right now around the world. The IMF, you look out and you think, this is, this is truly a remarkable time, is it not? It is. It is, but I think um, if there is one difference between the last big financial crisis, you mentioned that this one is 
I think that this time the Fed got it right much sooner than last time. Now, you could look at the negative interest rates. About half of that is in Europe and say, my God, this is unprecedented. How will that end? But I think that's actually working reasonably well. Uh, there are risks, and the biggest risks, I think, for financial stability is as this tide of liquidity created by central banks starts to recede. And I think what we will see is a substantially different structure of the financial markets underneath. Different investors, a lot of retail investors, a lot more automation, high frequency trading, uh, less market making by traditional market makers. But in my mind, with a little bit of luck, all this will mean is that there will be some bouts of volatility, there will be some instability at the margins, but at the end, things should work out well. The Fed should be able to manage this process. You know, I guess we are in Hollywood, so maybe they should remake less than zero, but this time it's about interest rates. Yes. <laughs> James Spader is Ben Bernanke, perhaps. Um, you know, Dimitri said, uh, Tad, that the Fed got it right. Have they got it right, or just have we not figured it out yet? Have we not gotten to any sort of end point yet? Could they still get it wrong? Oh, I think not only can they got it wrong, I think they have gotten it wrong. And I, and I think that one way to think about it is consider the task that they've set for themselves. This is what they're representing in terms of what they're going to deliver to, to all of us through the mere control of one single interest rate, the IOER. With that, they're going to deliver to us 3% growth, 2% inflation, financial stability, higher asset prices insofar as real estate and stocks. We're going to see well-contained inflation expectations, and we're going to see relatively well-contained interest rate structure. All that is going to be delivered just by a few people, a board of governors in Washington that has got it all worked out from, from one to the end. I think that the likelihood that they're going to be able to solve for all of these variables simultaneously is ridiculous. That central banks are spending too much of their time talking to markets and they're not listening to the message. You mentioned negative interest rates. I'll just make one statement about it. <clears throat> it seems to me that the whole purpose of negative interest rates is the ECB looks at the wage price structure of Europe and says, oh no, they want to, they want to, the markets want to take wages and prices down because the productivity of the European worker doesn't justify it. But we can't allow wages and prices to go down because deflation is like economic destruction, or at least in the mind of a central bank. So rather than let the market correct it, we'll drive essentially interest rates into negative territory and we'll push the value of the euro down. Um, I don't think anybody with any common sense is going to agree that you're going to survive long term with a negative rate structure which just means you're ultimately going to be back in the same mess that you started with. It's just that you have essentially deferred the problem, and that's the short answer of the, of the question, which is that I think that central banks are very good at, at kicking the can down the road and telling us that it's all going to be better, and every cycle has died a violent death. But this one probably will too. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this because we've, we, we, this debate has been going on now for, mm -hmm. for years, ever since the Fed really got involved, and there's so much passion on both sides. And here's something else. So this is a congressman to a Fed chairman. When do you think there is a possibility of returning to a free and open market instead of this pegged and artificially controlled financial market that we have now? And the Federal Reserve chairman responded, never, not in your lifetime or mine. That was in 1941. That was in 1941. So Paul, I wonder, and I, I understand that we've had this <coughs> amazing level of, of stimulus and QE and monetary and fiscal response, but has the market always had some exogenous thing that has pushed it around? Uh, well, it certainly does. A lot of exogenous forces operate on the market. But I think apropos of this discussion, Brian, uh, you know, the, the monetary policy is a funny thing because, uh, you know, Ted mentioned the, you know, seven or eight people or 14 people around a table in, in the Board of Governors, FOMC, maybe that's more like, you know, 15, 17. Um, how do they actually rule the world? Well, what they're really doing is trying to influence the economy through the financial system, through financial conditions. And really all any central bank can do uh, when it comes to monetary policy is either loosen, try to loosen financial conditions or try to tighten financial conditions. And that's, that's what they're trying to do. Now, the last six years, of course, they've been heavily into trying to loosen financial conditions. But of course, because we had the financial crisis and uh, the, 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 the Great Recession after that, 
uh, there was a lot of work for monetary policy to do. And maybe monetary policy was not <coughs> actually the right tool for the times. Uh, when you're in a deleveraging kind of cycle and you've got very low interest rates, maybe that is, heretical thought, a time when fiscal policy can provide more stimulus. But the Fed doesn't control fiscal policy. They don't get to make that call. Their mandate is low and stable inflation and full employment of the economy. They've got limited tools, they use those tools. Hit the zero bound quickly, December 2008. What do they do next? It was still in the middle of the Great Recession. They needed to do something, they switched to quantitative easing. We can probably talk about that more, but I think quantitative easing is perhaps overanalyzed. It's a little bit simpler than people make it out to be. You know, I guess, I guess Scott, I mean, you, you know, I, I, the Fed is, is theoretically supposed to nudge, and I, I guess a criticism, and uh, the ECB, or the BOJ, or whoever it might be, instead of nudging, is shoving? Well, I think, Brian, they have to, right? There, there are two things here. Um, there is an unwillingness to think that there is any flexibility at all in terms of phys fiscal policy in the United States and Europe. That the idea that tomorrow we could launch a trillion dollar infrastructure program for America uh, is just outside of the realm of anybody believing it's possible. So the idea that we, we can do some massive st stimulus uh, is basically off the table, whether it's supply-side stimulus or it's Keynesian stimulus. Well, because rates are at zero. I mean, I think, well, that's, I mean, I think it's that, that's the reason. Well, I think that, but if you look at it this way, if tomorrow the government were to create a federal agency that allowed off-balance sheet borrowing of a trillion dollars to build infrastructure in the United <laughs> States, you, you, could, you could do a lot to get people to work. And at the same time, uh, really, it's not going to matter given the size of how much debt. Would you consider that a monetary policy response? Well, no, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I think the monetary policy response is the, the, the fiscal side of the house is not going to do anything. And not only is the fiscal side of the house not going to do anything, and with all due respect to the man who is acting as the assistant secretary of the treasury uh, for our, our, our uh, president, uh, you know, uh, regulation in Washington uh, has basically uh, become so onerous upon the financial system that, it, that it's essentially clogged up the plumbing. And so the only way to, um, to try to get the economy to move is to overwhelm all of this with massive, massive doses of, of uh, liquidity. Uh, which, you know, has led to large distortions in the pricing of capital uh, and I believe is leading to inefficiency in investment, which is going to lead to longer-term problems. And someday, uh, someday, uh, as Dimitri was commenting, you know, we, we've decided this is the way, this is the only way we have to address the party, but someday we're going to say, oh, you know what, we don't need this liquidity anymore, or we need to try to reverse. But I, I, I guess setting ourselves up. Dimitri, speak to that, because I guess the point I was <coughs> trying to make with these historical quotes was that, and I hear your point about the distortion of capital. I wonder, though, two world wars in 100 years, depression, the Great Recession, uh, you know, coming off the gold set, whatever. Has there always been, and you do a lot of historical work, some sort of distortion in the price of capital? When has there ever been a pure time where we could price capital to a true market? without a distortion. Indeed not. And in fact, if you go back before the Second World War or immediately after, there were a lot more distortions in the world financial system and in the world trading system. We have made a lot of progress in removing these distortions, and we have made a lot of progress collectively in opening up and liberalizing financial markets, both inside countries and across borders. But I wanted to go back to a point that you made about um, the, the, the burden of regulation. There is no doubt that since the financial crisis, we have seen a very ambitious and extremely broad-based financial regulation reform in the US and worldwide. And I think we need to remember why that was. That was because we discovered that the system had taken an extent of risk that it could not manage, and that even the regulators with the existing tools back in 2007 could not manage. So it's important to remember why we started this agenda and, and how broad-based this agenda has been. And I would argue that this has been a very positive, there have been very positive steps in that direction with strengthening the capital framework for banks and in both changing the definition and increasing the required level of capital. 
introducing a new liquidity framework through the Basel Agreement, having rules on securitization, rules on over-the-count um, derivatives, and putting on the agenda, at least putting on the table, the structural reform measures, the Vickers, Volcker, Lee Cannon agenda. This is an important agenda and arguably necessary given what happened. And I think my concern on that reform is not so much that it has clogged the system, but that the political window that existed after the crisis is now shutting rapidly, and we need to make effort to complete that agenda. Can I just jump in on that? I mean, I, I personally appreciate Dimitri's point uh, there about the regulation and what it's aiming at and what it needs to address. <clears throat> uh, the opening quotation about, you know, looking in, in the discussion about looking back over history, I think the main thing we really need to keep in mind when we're discussing regulation and what it has done is that it's made the financial system, it's made large financial institutions safer, it's reduced leverage, it's increased capital in the banking system. Um, we can't ever be complacent, but I, don't, I think we want to make sure we don't uh, countenance going back to uh, a financial system that we had in 2007 that led to the Great Recession, that led to the financial crisis, because we all know how long it took to, to recover from that. And can I also add something, Brian? Sure. On this, you know, when um, the capital rules, they knew the Basel III agreement started being debated, there was a lot of study about what the impact would be on bank profitability, the financial intermediation more broadly, and ultimately growth. And there have been reports ranging from the um, IIF on one end that predicted, just to caricature a bit, that the sky will fall on our head, growth will stop, and all sorts of bad things will happen, to um, a group put together by regulators with the participation of the IMF called the Macroeconomic Assessment Group that predicted that full phased in Basel III rules would reduce global growth by a few tenths of a percentage point over the long term. A few months ago, Steve Cecchetti, the former chief economist of the BAS, issued a paper, and he argued that, in fact, the chips are in, the jury is in, and the optimists have been anything too optimistic on the impact of the growth. In other words, that this huge capital uh, change in capital rules have not only not affected visibly growth, but it has actually strengthened the system. So the benefits are there in terms of reduced risk, reduced risk of instability, and the cost turns out to be less than what we thought it was. That is why I, I wanted to, to make that point. But, but Dimitri, don't you think that, that the, the reaction we have in terms of the development of regulation is really just to some degree, a political response for the failure of the regulators to do what they were already mandated to do before the crisis. There are a lot of powers that are in the hands of the Fed, for instance, to re regulate lending, to regulate mortgage quality, lending quality. Those standards were not applied. And so now the answer is to to create this, this cobweb network of regulation which has become so complex and multi-layered that it's now inhibiting the ability to provide liquidity to the financial markets uh, that is increasingly pushing risk into the shadow banking system and into areas which isn't regulated that's ultimately going to end up, you know, blowing up on us, for lack of a better thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump in with a, with a couple of thoughts that I think expand on that. I think to organize the discussion <coughs> a little bit is we have to recognize that interest rates are not arbitrary constructs. They're, they're, they're prices. They're supposed to be set, predicated, like any prices, set in the marketplace. And when a, when a board in Washington is attempting or usurping, so to speak, the, uh, the knowledge and the information of the market and says, oh, we know better where, where interest rates are supposed to be. Look at what's really happening, okay? P part of the, the confusion and the conflation is that the Fed controls the market for loanable funds, okay? But it doesn't control anything about the market for actual capital inputs concrete, energy, skilled workers, patents, intellectual property. You can create all the loanable funds you want, okay? But you're not doing anything to affect the supply of this stuff. So what it does suggest is that, okay, so the Fed says we think zero rates is a much better rate than 3% or 5% or whatever the market would find. First consequence is asset prices go higher. Asset prices go higher. If you've got assets, you're winning the game of monopoly. 
So in effect, you're in a situation where you got all the collateral. And so when you face a bank, you get to borrow on preferential terms. So in all of the discussion about you know, how too much of the resources are being diverted to those with assets, rich getting richer, that type of stuff, look at who is the cause of the problem. The, the, it's, it's the Fed. It is the, it is the sort of broadly regular, uh, described regulatory machinery that's creating the very problem that they're supposed to be solving. So I agree with the point is that long ago, I think the time came for essentially the Fed and central banks in general to just say, you know what? There's too much to figure out, and we're no good at figuring it out. But I, 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 Paul, jump in, and if you don't know Paul by history, Paul lived in Japan for nearly 20 years. So you are literally big in Japan, my friend. Congratulations. <laughs> and let's not forget, Tad, that, that our Federal Reserve, and I'm not defending what they did, didn't create quantitative easing. Japan did. Correct, yes, uh, March 2001, uh, to be precise, which lasted for five years. But, you know, we were talking before, Brian, about what are the lessons of history, and you uh, quoted from Mariner Eccles, etc. Of course, one of the big lessons from history that I think the Fed, uh, Bernanke Fed, uh, really brought into this financial crisis, and also people like Tim Geithner. I met Tim Geithner for the first time in Tokyo when he was assistant secretary, uh, attaché to the, the, the uh, Tokyo uh, US Embassy. So he cut his teeth early on in his career, even before the Asia crisis in Tokyo, looking at the Japanese crisis. So a lot of lessons were brought to the table from the, crisis, uh, the, the situation in Japan. And it wasn't all about monetary policy. Um, let me put a plug in here for the TARP as well. You know, a, a dirty word in some circles, um, but I think the big policy error that Japan made was they had a banking crisis, they covered it up, they played for time, they hoped that they'd grow out of it, it didn't work. I think the TARP, the capital injections, the stress tests, that was the right medicine back in 2008, 2009, combined with the monetary policy. But I think we're having kind of two conversations here around monetary policy. Um, one, I think, I don't want to put words in Tad's mouth, but I think the sort of almost end the Fed, get the Fed out of, the, out of, out of town kind of thing. And I think then, that's a big debate. That's really questioning the whole macroeconomic framework we have in the Western world. And then I think we need to have a debate about, well, if you don't like that system, what system would you want? But I think if we take the, the system more or less as it is existing in the world today, the Fed does have a job given to it, central banks have a job. Then you ask the question, well, what can they do and then what should they do? So to put my cards on the table, I am a supporter of what the Fed has done with quantitative easing because I think they hit the zero bound, they're still a long way away from achieving their objectives and they faced a serious risk of going into a deflation like Japan did. And it's much harder to get out of a deflation than it is to prevent an economy going into a oh. deflation. Now, they could have a debate that says, well, what's wrong with deflation? But I think that's not what is in the Fed's job statement, allowing deflation. Although, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll put a couple of thoughts out, and um, you know, at least it, it keeps a conversation or, or, or a dialogue, is that um, the Fed, and the Fed is, is, an, is an extreme you know, point of view. I mean, obviously, a fractional banking system needs a lender of last resort. The question becomes that, the skill, if the house is burning, you call the fire department. Absolutely, okay? And after they put the fire out, you don't say keep squirting the house with water because it's going to you know, sprout and turn into a bigger and, um, and more beautiful house than what, what you started with. Meaning that the emergency, the first responder emergency response skill is not the same as saying, I know how to run a construction business because I know how, know how to put out a fire. And this, if I could put it this way, there's almost a shibboleth of of um, central banking and, and modern economics that says, oh, a deflation is the end of the world. I mean, prices can only go up, or certain kinds of prices can only go up. They're never allowed to go down. What about air travel, computers, iPhones, gasoline? Do people say, oh my goodness, the computer's going down in price next year. I don't want to touch the thing. I mean, obviously, there's a current period benefit associated. So th it's a little too glib. Right. But there's a big... Yeah, let's, had, uh, hold on, had, let's go to this side here. We Brian, can I just finish the, the point? Shibboleth, by the way. I've not heard that today. That was <laughs> Brian, can I finish the My point? Contribution. I, I think it's very important to make a distinction between relative prices, which Ted is referring to. Some prices go down, some prices go up, and the overall price level, which is really what the Fed is in. And I will disagree with you a little bit, Tad, and you're, and because, it, guys, speak to the idea that, yes, you don't continue fighting the fire with water, but sometimes the way to prevent a huge fire is to start a small fire and a controlled burn. Well, I wanted to talk about on two things. One is about deflation, and I very much agree with what Paul said. We have to distinguish between 
reductions in prices of individual goods and a generalized and prolonged process of declines in the price level, the opposite of inflation. And the latter is not something that I would take too lightly because it does a number of things. First of all, it doesn't usually happen in a vacuum. It happens, it is associated with a deep recession and that has real economic costs for, for households, for businesses and, and for sovereigns. Second, it makes policy much more difficult because of the zero lower bound in monetary policy. So deflation, unlike inflation, makes the job of monetary policy much more difficult and much less effective. And third, if you are carrying debt, whether you're a government or a household, deflation makes carrying that debt, the cost of the debt much higher. So I would not be so relaxed about deflation. As regards the big and small fire and, 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 and the role of the fire brigade, I think there is a little bit of a false analogy in, in the example that, that you gave because I don't think it's right to see the role of the Fed or of financial regulation more broadly as simply the fire department that steps in when the house burns down. I think there is a role to play even when the house has not caught fire yet. And sometimes that role may involve starting a small fire, Sometimes that role uh, certainly should involve making sure that there are extinguishers in the house, making sure that people know what to do in case a fire breaks out. And that process can be and arguably should be quite intrusive, just to make sure that a fire will not break out, or, or if it does, everybody knows what to do. One last uh, potentially overly academic point on deflation, the relative prices versus overall price level. I think, at least from the wonky economist perspective, one also wants to keep in mind there's a great deal of, of empirical evidence for the nominal rigidity of wages in particular, and wages being the price of labor in the economy are a particularly important relative price. To the extent that wages are nominally sticky downward, uh, deflation actually, I think, is generally understood to be much more costly than, than inflation. So for the non-PhD economists in the audience, could you please go a little bit more into the idea of nominal wage rigidity? Sure. I mean, the idea is, in principle, we want markets to have prices adjust in order to clear the market. Uh, wages are the price of labor. And if um, there is, by social convention or for some other reason, uh, nominal wage rigidity, which is to say people just tend not to cut people's wage, the actual dollar that's printed in your per hour wage, it's just, again, it just, the, the evidence is that that just tends not to get cut very often. And so if uh, one wants wages to adjust to, to, to equilibrate the labor market, you can't, and, and for many good reasons, potentially rely on nominal wages falling. And so that ends up meaning the labor market can't adjust quite as easily as perhaps some other markets. This is one of the reasons why economists, you know, there's an entire branch of the economics field studying labor markets, is because that market is, is, a, is a particular market and can't be compared to just Jekyll. Let's, let's talk about the idea of what these institutions mean. And maybe next year we'll do the Milk and Commons on Jekyll Island. Just an, just an idea. But let's talk about, this This is weird. So I saw this in the journal. 75% <coughs> of Americans don't have any idea who Janet Yellen is. Never heard of her. Yes, it should be. Yeah, but that's, well, so <laughs> we, are, we are talking about the Fed. We're talking about monetary response, fiscal policy, et cetera, et cetera. Are we putting way too much hope and faith and weight on the Fed or Treasury or the ECB or the BOJ or any other series of acronyms? Well, I mean, look, you know, we have a highly intrusive government who has developed a series of regulations and policies which are interfering with the clearing of markets. And, um, you know, a question that comes to mind is, why didn't this downturn respond uh, in the historic way that every downturn does in terms of a recovery once the Fed reduced rates to a certain level? Now, there are some good reasons, right? One is, you know, the, the consumer was in shock, households had huge amounts of net worth wiped out, and so we resorted to a policy of quantitative easing, which was designed to restore the wealth that was lost in the process. But at the same time, there were other regulations uh, put into place which inhibited the, the mechanisms by which capital could freely flow. And that is, has been detrimental to employment to the growth of small business, 
and to other things which has inhibited, has inhibited the economy overall and has fundamentally changed the nature of how our economy works, just like the New Deal did, just like the things that you were quoting from when we started. I just wonder if, it's hard to argue the, argue the counterfactual though, right? I mean, so we, at this point, we can't go back in time and say, well, what if the Fed didn't do this or we didn't have these tarps and we, we've had them and we're here and this is where we are now and I wanna look right. forward. It, I think we're sort of interesting in a sense that the ECB is starting. So we've got to, now we can sort of, you know, look, point and laugh, aha, you know, you got five years of political, maybe I'll just move the show over there for the next five years. Well, we'll take, take that example though. You asked the question about, can we, can we, should we be reliant on the central banks to fix fundamental or significant economic problems? Let's take a look at Europe for a moment, okay? Maybe others will have different views here. 19 countries, one currency, one monetary system. 5%, 6% unemployment in Austria and Germany, 25% in Spain and Greece. Is that because there isn't enough credit in Europe? Is it because we're not doing enough helicopter drops of money? I'll give you my explanation, maybe I'm wrong. But the simple Occam's razor solution is, is that German industry, Austrian industry is globally competitive. It sees its fair share, so to speak, of global aggregate demand. You increase aggregate demand, it gets sourced to wherever it is competitive. Is that uncompetitive businesses will never participate in the global economy because nobody in his right mind is going to buy a product that they don't want at the price that they don't want to pay. And if you think a central bank is going to solve that, I would say, I don't think so. And so what I think it's supposed to lead you back to is gets back to the question is, what is the proper role of a central bank? How about this? How about allowing the, the actual process of economic growth, which is really a result of business owners, labor, entrepreneurs, figuring out a better way to do their job each and every day over a long period of time. And you make it 1% better each year and you grow. Let people figure it out instead of telling them that, oh, well, you know, deflation means we have an excess of capacity over demand, and so clearly we have to up the demand somehow, and we use artificial means to do it. Maybe what the market is telling you is that, yeah, you've got an excess of capacity over demand. Let the market fix it by lowering the price of that capacity, and it might get fully utilized. Um, you, you mentioned, Brian, the counterfactual. We can't see the counterfactual, but we can see the data. And what the data tells us is that in the Great Recession, real GDP in the US fell, I think the number's 4.2%. By mid-2009, it was recovering. <clears throat> Unemployment by the end of 2009 went up to 10% with it, because of a lag. Uh, in the Eurozone, GDP fell about 6%. In Japan, it fell about 9%. And those economies are barely back to their pre-crisis level. The level of real GDP in the US is about 9% above the pre-crisis level. And it's because of that cumulative increase in output that unemployment has come down from 10% to 5.5%. So yes, the headwinds in this recovery have been very stiff because of everything we know about deleveraging, et cetera. But you know, it, it, it has been a <coughs> half decent recovery. On your question of you know, too much emphasis on central banks, yes, let's face it, we're in the financial markets. Um, everybody has a kind of obsession with the Fed. It's sort of the nature of the beast. Um, we do need, I think, to de-emphasize a little I'll, bit. And I'll, listen, and, and, and uh, Seth, I'll defend the government a little bit in a sense. You guys are in a tough spot because we don't, what if this, what if this is true? We look at Japan, Europe, and the United States. What do they all have in common? Crap demographics, all right? Well, not the United States. No, 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 no. We're no, we're starting to roll now. We've got more twenty-five-year-olds working, will, yeah, we'll but we have it. negative birth rates in many places in no, Europe. But pop aging population. No, I agree, but you got to remember, that in our country, until twenty forty, demographics of the working age population will continue to rise, largely because of our good immigration program. Yeah, we're starting to roll over uh, in a good way, is what I mean. Right. In a good way. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking back. I'm looking back yeah. in ways. And Europe is terrible. I mean, I think Italy's got a negative birth rate. Uh, and a lot of elderly, Japan, good grief, we don't need to talk about that. And China's coming down the road, my friend. If you looked at the China demographic profile. So the reason I'm saying I wonder if the government gets a raw deal is, are we looking at the Fed or Treasury to fix a problem that maybe, and not taking aside a little bit of the, the, the Great Recession and the, and the mortgage market crisis, that we've got people retiring, we've got high productivity, maybe the labor force participation rate, won't go, won't, won't go up because the jobs aren't needed anymore because one guy is now doing the job of 10. Is there, is there anything out there that suggests that maybe it's, it's not just a fiscal situation? 
So I think I absolutely agree with the general thesis that it's extraordinarily You agree that I defended complex. the government? And perfect. <laughs> uh, it's an absolutely complicated situation. And thinking about, let me just take one point though that you said about labor force participation. Maybe it continues to fall because productivity is high. I, I think that's sort of uh, not necessarily the best way of thinking about longer run economic growth. So for example, productivity from say right before the Great Recession back to the beginning of the 20th century, <clears throat> long period of growth. You look at productivity, it went up. Uh, I will get the number wrong, but it's something like by a factor of 10. And what did not happen was that we didn't just see a bunch of workers lay idle because they wanted to keep the same level of aggregate income, but with one-tenth the amount of labor. In fact, you see the labor uh, market continuing to grow, and it's overall output that continues to grow. And that is one of the most important reasons why productivity is clearly critical to long-run growth in the economy. Um, so I think your general point, though, is absolutely right. It's critical. I think um, uh, the demographic aspect is one that you can't ignore. Uh, Scott mentioned the role of immigration. The administration has had a proposal to reform immigration policy. The Congressional Budget Office did a, an assessment of one of the proposals that went through and points to meaningful um, effects in terms of labor force uh, uh, participation and to increases in GDP uh, over the long run, I think for all the reasons that, that Scott was laying out. You know, and Dimitri, you know, I, I've been to Greece and it's, it's a country where the unemployment rate among 25 year olds is something like 40%. There's no jobs for them. And there's, and there's a lot of retirees. And I don't, when you look at say, and I'm not picking on Greece, um, but if you look at Italy, you look at Greece, and I'm thinking, what the world is Mario Draghi going to be able to do about the fact that there's more 75-year-olds and 40% and, and of the 25-year-olds aren't working and no new job creation? No, exactly right. And I think... What, uh, what is the ECB supposed to do about that? Exactly. No, and I think um, that's the, the point that uh, Ted made earlier about the limits of monetary policy is absolutely spot on, particularly when it comes to the Eurozone. When I look at the Eurozone, what I see is, first of all, an economy where growth, although it's restarting this year, is still extremely slow, very disappointing. A place that has, uh, where households and businesses in some countries more than others, still labor under a huge burden of debt. It's very, very difficult to dig yourself out of this. And where, more imp most importantly, perhaps, the whole economic policy framework, the whole economic governance framework is to put it charitably, incomplete. So these problems go well beyond Mario Draghi's capacity, or the ECB's capacity to manage. And these are the really important and deep long-term challenges for Europe. Uh, and I haven't even mentioned Grexit. You know, the, the good folks at the Milken Institute, they've got a lot of hardworking people that don't get any credit at all, by the way, to set these panels up. And our panel brought no slides, but the, the Milken folks made some slides. So we should probably show one because they put some time into them. Slide seven. Or a brand new car. No, oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> investors fear Greek default while other GIIPS yield less than the US 10-year government bond yields. All right, so here we are. We're looking at, we're looking at, we're looking at Greece. Um, I don't know if this is telling us, Scott, that, I mean, something we don't know, <laughs> right? I mean, I, in fact, I, I, I could, you could make, that's another panel. You could make the argument Greece already defaulted three years ago, we talked to ISDA and go through the whole swap thing. No thanks. Uh, what does this chart mean? What does this say to you? And what does it say to you is going to happen? Greek's gonna, Greece is going to default. I mean, <laughs> that's it. And then what? Well, you know, I, I, you know we were, uh, I, I, do, they pay, do they pay any debt back in drachma well, or euro? I mean, it's interesting. They can re-denominate the debt. Uh, you know, a lot of people forget that uh, we went through a debt crisis in Europe before. Uh, it was after the, three years ago, also. Yeah, <laughs> um, it, it, after the First World War, and uh, the reparation payments that were imposed on the defeated nations, uh, for instance, Germany, finally paid back its last reparation payment to the United States in something like 2012. So, you know, from World War One. From World War One. So the idea that it should take a century to clean up a financial mess uh, is not an unusual concept. Um, I think the, the, the real solution for Greece is, is essentially to extend the debt and cut the rate of interest 
and understand that this will take probably the better part of a century to clean up. Uh, however, I think right now, given what's going on in Europe, there's a political impasse um, that, uh, uh, that there's a feeling in the core, perhaps right, that uh, if, they, if they just go ahead and amend the debt, extend it, and, and cut the rate dramatically, um, that that would uh, uh, basically be just another opportunity for Greece to to borrow some more money and get itself into a worse. Yeah, you know, Tad, this is an interesting, it's a really important point that you're bringing up, too, and you talked about the can and the road. <coughs> and history does suggest that the road the can is being kicked down can be a long road sometimes. Is there a, you know, we, and sort of, you know, listen, we in the media are very, we want things to happen now, everything's breaking news, let's fix it. We're month to month, day to day, hour to hour, whatever it is. Is there a chance this, this, it's like Neil Young, right? Better to burn out than to fade away. Like, is this, is there a chance it's just gonna go on for decades? And like, we'll be here in 10 years talking about the Greek debt crisis? Like, like the last two minutes of some basketball games or something, they just, they just, yeah, exactly. they just keep going on. They're fouling Italy again, but he's not good at the line. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's a couple, I think, interesting things to say about this. And um, one of them uh, I probably also gets to one of these fundamental, uh, you know, sort of, you know, big arguments in economics. So um, there are those who say, if I got a great econometric model, I can tell you what's going to happen. I know what policy I, I, I should do. If you think about the nature of cycles and what we were taught about them, if I could put it this way, they're all wrong. All of the traditional economic explanations that you see in uh, textbooks, all the things that the Fed says, they don't fit the facts, right? So traditionally, if it was- All of them? Pretty much. Let me, I'll show you. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, any textbook would say that the cycles are driven by inventory, okay? There hasn't been an inventory cycle in North America in 40 years. Throw that one in the, in the trash. Second explanation is, is that it's inflation. Now, don't you understand, when inflation gets too high, then that shows that there's an excess of animal spirits and demand in the system, and then the central banks have to raise rates. Okay, so, so you're telling me that 2008 was an inflation problem? 2002 was an inflation problem? How about 1998, 1994, 1990? You've had 25 years of deleveragings. Not one of them has come to an end because of inflation. So to your point is that what seems to be driving the cycle is actually the financial markets themselves. As long as the financial markets are willing to believe, if they're willing to say, sure, I'll make one more stupid loan to one more insolvent borrower, you can keep the game going for as long as people are willing to essentially engage in transactions that probably they're going to ultimately regret. But you can keep the game going for a, substantially, for a substantial period of time until the financial markets say, no mas, the game is over, and then traditionally we have these deleveragings every you know, five, six, eight years. Can I, can I just come in on Greece, uh, Brian? Yeah, you got, got another shot up. Right, I mean, this, uh, you know, uh, Dimitri just alluded to this, but the fundamental problem, in, in my view, in the Eurozone is that you have a flawed or dysfunctional economic architecture. You have a system where these 19 countries have pooled their monetary sovereignty. That means it's effectively as if each country, although they all have the euro, it's as if they're borrowing in a foreign country. Will the monetary Cur union foreign, last? Foreign currency. Will the monetary union last? Will it hold? Will the Maastricht Treaty? That's, well, that's a, big, that's, a, that's a very big question. The Maastricht Treaty is a little bit different. But anyway, it, who knows, longer term, well, here's my point on the, on the monetary union, will it last? It will have to change. And you can look at the Eurozone as essentially a problem of too much monetary union relative to the amount of fiscal union. There's almost no fiscal union. So the ultimate, that is a very unholy kind of system. No other country, no other system really has that. So the ultimate steady state will be less monetary union, that's the, some sort of fragmentation. That is, these peripheral countries, for example, go back to their own currencies, regain that right to print their own currency, and then they can actually uh, depreciate their currencies and get a competitive boost. Should Greece or, go back to or, the drachma? Should Greece go back to or, the drachma? Or they have to complete the monetary union, which means adding the fiscal union. Now, I'm not making this up. There's a thing called the Four Presidents Report, which was put out in 2012, which said we have to build a genuine economic and monetary union by having banking union. Guess what? They've done that, doing it. Fiscal union, true economic union, and political union. So the, 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 the roadmap is there in Europe. The Europeans have actually flagged all of this. But why are we now at this Greek uh, crisis? Because they haven't actually done either of those two things. Greece didn't leave the Eurozone 
depreciate its currency, default, and get, and, and get on with life, but they haven't also moved to complete that fiscal union. So I think they're in a kind of no man's land, a very difficult situation. The level of real GDP in Greece today is 25.5% below the pre-crisis peak. It's like a Great Depression. And they don't have the macro policy tools. We've been trashing macro policy a little bit today. Well, they, I mean, but Paul, they don't have the macro policy tools they, to give them. They the also tools. have hundreds, if not thousands, of years of, of, of regional conflicts and strife and wars. And Greece and Germany, if you've been to each of them, I'm sure you have many times, they don't have much in common other than they start with the letter G, right? I mean, that, that's pretty much it. It's a, it's, Europe is a very different place. It, so just quickly before I go over here, I have a bunch of French francs in my drawer from my first trip to Europe. Will I be able to use them again? Uh, I would not bet on it. Okay. If, you, if you've got some drac, <coughs> you've probably got a better chance. A good chance or a slightly better chance? Better than, better than francs. <laughs> Is the drac coming back, Dimitri? Oh, boy. Um, well, um, it's, it's unfortunate. I'm Greek and I work for the IMF, so it was kind of an inevitable <laughs> question. But, uh, I didn't randomly <laughs> direct the Greece question to you by accident. Yes. Uh, let me just say that we have fairly strict rules of conflict of interest, so I don't work on Greece, I don't go to any meetings on Greece, I read the papers like all of you, and I have my views and I'm happy to share them, but, um, but they're not official IMF views. There, I said it and everybody heard it. I've so, never even been to Greece. <laughs> <laughs> He's from Cyprus, don't tell anybody. So, no. I, a couple of points. Is there, what is the risk of... Greek exit, and, and I have to say that in my personal view, it's extremely low, and, and the reason why I think it's extremely low may sound very naive, but it is because no one seems to want it. No one in Greece, no one in the rest of Europe. There is no government, European institution, or, or major constituency that seems to be in favor of exit from the euro. Default is another story altogether. So that's point number one. Point number two, and I think that speaks to what Paul just said, and it's quite important. Greece has had in some way, an extremely tough fiscal adjustment. The, the fiscal deficit was cut by something like 15 percentage points. This is, if I'm not mistaken, the largest, or certainly one of the largest fiscal adjustments in peacetime anywhere in the world. And yet, the problem is still with us. That hasn't worked. So I have a little bit of sympathy, but that's very little, with the position of the current government that says, look, we are dealing with a strategy that really hasn't worked for us because we did more or less what we're supposed to on the fiscal side, but nothing else has happened. You know, and what's interesting, Seth, is that Greece, I mean, listen, Greece is, is a small, I mean, it, it's, it, it, however small you think it is, the economy <clears throat> is smaller than that. I mean, it's something like the size of Delaware, the GDP. And, and, it, and we spend this inordinate amount of time talking about it at Treasury, how much is, is Greece or their situation on your radar? Um, so we have an extensive set of colleagues who work on the international uh, aspect of everything in financial markets. Um, what the secretary has said, other senior treasury officials who work on the international side of things have said is that they've urged the Greeks to work towards technical reforms to come up with a comprehensive solution that there's still time to get there. The secretary's caution is uh, failure to reach those sorts of agreements are going to lead to potentially serious hardships for the Greek people, uncertainty for the rest of Europe, uncertainty for financial markets. And so the, the secretary's position has been to urge the Greeks to fully engage. So it's, it's, it's there. It is in discussions at Treasury. I mean, it's something that's on the radar. Absolutely. What, why? Well, why is, why is Greece so important? Well, I think you're asking the question, Brian, of what would be the fallout from a Grexit, for example. Uh, 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 and, you know, uh, what well, our view... Or not a, maybe not a Grexit, maybe just a, def a default. I mean, well, they've already, they can stay in the money they've defaulted, union. They've defaulted twice already, so... And, I, I, and I've said I, I believe they did default three years ago, but... Right. Well, they, we at S&P have got them on a very, low, a, a very low sovereign rating, so we, you know, it would not surprise anybody if they defaulted again. But I think the contagion <clears> issue, you know, if, I think if you look at the direct spillover effects from... from Greece, a Grexit, they're about 2% of the Eurozone, and as you said, getting smaller. Um, markets have, got a lot, have had a lot of time to, 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 to see this coming, and a lot of the financing of Greece now is away from the private sector. It's on the books and the balance sheet of the government, the official sector, including the IMF. So uh, you know, the direct fallout uh, would probably not be very big, and that's what markets are telling you with that chart. Look at, look at you know, the yields in the other periphery uh, are not going up at all. So the markets think it's, it's, it's okay. One of the reasons is the ECB's quantitative easing, 
uh, that I think is, is, is certainly helping to allay some of those fears. But I think the bigger question for the Grexit would be the fact that it would establish, it would put a lie to the uh, existing kind of um, legal framework that says the Eurozone is like Hotel California, that you enter and you never check out. And if one country exits the Eurozone, probably there won't be a big hullabaloo right now, but if it turns out further down the track, this is not working. And now it's the 18th marginal economy that's coming under the magnifying glass of the markets. You will not be able to say, don't even think about an exit of that country because it can never happen, because it will have happened. So I think it's the precedent mm -hmm. and the way that that changes the future possibilities for other countries that is the thing that would probably scare policymakers. I think that there's maybe two interesting things you could say in, in addition, is that we should remember, as you sort of alluded to, that this was going to be the United States of Europe. Euro was just the first step. This was, a, this was again, one of these grand, uh, you know, great plans about um, uh, fixing the world's and, and, and a big social engineering um, uh, activity. Now, I have been told that for the first hundred years of the history of the United States of America, that the U was actually lowercase meaning that it was written as in, you know, wasn't thought of as a single entity. The states were thought of as separate countries, meaning it took a century to evolve from a collection of states into a modern federal republic. To think that you're going to jam it down the throats of 300 million Europeans just because a bunch of bureaucrats in, um, where are they, Brussels uh, say so, I think is, I, I think that that's fantastical. You know, and you could check out any time you like, but you could never leave. <laughs> <Actually>. Okay. <laughs> Scott, do you, Paul's point, if Greece, are we only focused on Greece because if it defaults, then Italy and Spain and everybody else is going to raise their hand and go, yo, we want the same deal. Well, well that's going to be, look, the, the, the question's going to be at a popular level. If Greece gets out of this mess by just walking away from its debts and it's not a catastrophic consequence to them, Meaning, you know... And nothing ever seems to be as catastrophic as we think it's going to be. Have you noticed that? Well, certainly when you live in Greece, you know, you can enjoy the sun, go down. <laughs> it's just not that bad. But, you know, the, the, the thing is that there's going to be a... Po the risk is a popular backlash. Um, but any crisis uh, is an opportunity, I think, to strengthen the, the fiscal union of Europe. Uh, you know, I agree very much with what Tad said. Um, people forget how diverse our country was. In, I think it was 1787, uh, by one vote, the decision was made to speak English and not German. Uh, you know, we were a much more eclectic people than we give, you know, our, our perspective on. But I think the reality is that uh, there will have to be a strong response from uh, Brussels uh, that will probably result in the extension of things like uh, deposit insurance and other things which, which help to strengthen the union. And people on the periphery will have to see that there's a benefit to the union. And, and one of the things that I would say, in fairness to the Greeks, um, is that, uh, you know, all the, look at this chart, Brian, right? Put that chart up again as if, if people can't see it. But, Look at the benefits that all of Europe got from what Mario Draghi did in terms of being able to reprice their debt, except for one country. And there is an opportunity, in, well, to, in fairness, to say, you know what, since Greece didn't get the opportunity to participate in the benefits of QE, we should, we should reprice their and, debt. And maybe some enough. Germans, Dimitri, should be saying, Efaristo, because it's bringing the euro down in a good way for their export competitiveness, Europe has received some benefit <coughs> from what's happened, right? It's not all complaints. Well, it has certainly received benefits from what happened, and I think the point is important that all countries were able to participate in this as much as they could. Now, nobody is responsible for Greece's predicament but the Greeks themselves. But in answer to your question, Brian, why is everybody worried so much about Greece? Nobody is responsible for the impact that Greece has or could have on the EU except the EU itself. Because as you said, Greece is very, very small. We're going to wrap know, it up here. Well, one, th one thing, though, Brian, I want to say, right, yeah. is that, that, sorry. It's your panel. But, well, you know, thank you for having me. You, know, you are the underwriter. Thank you for coming on here. You're also <laughs> the underwriter of the conference. <laughs> the, um, uh, 
just quickly, the point I was going to make is, you know, this idea that there are a bunch of older, retired people living on this peninsula down in, in Europe, and that maybe we have to have transfer payments and, and, and other subsidies from the center of Europe going down to this peninsula, peninsula looks, you know, peculiarly familiar to me. There's this peninsula in America called Florida where we send large federal transfer payments to retired people that live down there, and, and they do quite well. And so I think that the idea of, of the way the Europeans look at the problem uh, uh, could have a huge impact on how to get it solved. Well, we're going to wrap it there, but you just established next year's premier panel, olive oil or oranges. <laughs> Which would you buy? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the premiere panel next year, and I hope everybody wants to come back. Well, let's give a hand to Seth, Dimitri, Scott, Tad, and Paul. Thank you all.